Alrighty. The Sigel Museum, where NCHGS is based, is home to a significant collection of pre-European settlement artifacts that have been curated, loaned, and donated in collaboration with the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and with members of our broader community as well. Our newest permanent exhibit, Destination Northampton County, tells the stories of those who settled here long ago as well as today. We encourage you to become a member of NCHGS for invitations to opening receptions, free museum admission, and free access to our research library. For more information on our exhibits and our programs, please visit sigilmuseum.org. We will have a question and answer period following the conversation, so please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask our participants any questions and pose any questions that you would like clarification on. We also ask that you keep your microphone muted um, unless there is something that you would like to say out loud rather than type, if that is easier for you. So how we are going to proceed tonight, I will give a really brief introduction to the program, and then we will get into the, the questions and the conversations with our speakers. So you may be wondering why we titled this program, The Verdant Assassin. In 1869, an anonymous author penned a title, uh, penned a book with the title, The Green of the Period. Now the plot is fairly simple. There are three friends taking a train journey and they are discussing newspaper reports and their own close encounters with a villain that the author refers to as the verdant assassin. So who is this mysterious figure? And perhaps a more intriguing question, why is it green? The villain we learn is not a person, but a poison. A great deal of slow poisoning is going on in Great Britain, wrote Birmingham doctor William Hines in 1857. This slow poisoning was happening not from malice or from criminal activity, but from a poisonous pigment that was found in everyday household items. Back in 1771, when Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm, Sch Wilhelm Scheele, excuse me, developed a green pigment from a compound of copper arsenite. So shall I get off? No, no, you can't because I can't. I... No, I said, shall I get off of this? I can leave here. So this copper acetoarsenite pigment um, in the improved pigment, today what we would know as an emerald green color, quickly became popular in a, in a society that was surrounded by the smoky gray of early industrialization. This pigment was added to everyday household items such as women's dresses, curtains, wallpaper, and the topic of tonight's discussion, book bindings. Now the fact that arsenic was poisonous was certainly not a secret. In the 19th century, it was a common household item used as pest control for particularly, particularly rats and mice, and it could easily be purchased in a raw powder form from your local pharmacy. Easton even had its own arsenic horror story. In May of 1876, Alan Laros was the first man in Pennsylvania's history to successfully plead insanity after he poisoned his entire family by adding arsenic to their coffee. So why would arsenic be added to so many household items when it was common knowledge that it was poisonous? To answer that question, we must return to the social context of the time, particularly to the ideals of the Victorian middle class. We have two speakers with us tonight who are joining us to share their firsthand experiences with poisonous book bindings. Um, I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Melissa Tadone, conservator and lab head for library materials conservation at Winter Tour Museum, Garden and Library. She is the lead conservator of the Poison Book Project, an investigation of toxic colorants in 19th century Victorian book cloth, and a founder, a founding co-chair of the Bibliotoxicology Working Group an international cohort of conservators, conservation scientists, librarians, and health and safety professionals 
who are developing best practices for the identification and management of historical bookbinding collections with potentially toxic components. I'm also thrilled to welcome my own colleague, Monica Bugby, our curator of collections here at NCHGS. Monica spent 10 years in South Dakota working with archaeological and paleontological collections before returning to the Lehigh Valley. Her focus this past year was working with the Jane S. Moyer Library collections, which is how she first became aware of the existence of poison books. Tonight, Monica will take us behind the scenes into the NCHGS collection and our discoveries in our library stacks. Um, so thank you to both of you for being here. We will start with the questions now. Again, please feel free to ask any questions using the chat feature and please keep your microphone muted um, unless you would like to say something particular that you would rather not say in chat. So we'll start with Melissa. To better understand the context in which these pigments became popular, can you give us some background into the Victorian domestic ideal? Why were these bright green household items like books and curtains so popular? Um, thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the introduction. And um, it's so nice to be here with all of you tonight. Um, so the context of uh, this Victorian period um, really, I think, relies a lot on this sense of um, growing affluence among the Victorian middle class. Um, suddenly, there's a whole middle class that had disposable income. And this coincided with a time when a lot of domestic goods were going into mass production. And so um, they were very affordable. And so the confluence of these sort of two trends meant that people were very concerned with making their home a, a reflection of their social standing. Um, and they were preoccupied with questions like what is tasteful versus what is vulgar. Another um, trend that was happening at this time is the idea of uh, bringing nature into the home. If you can imagine um, living in the cities with industrialization, growing factories, it was very dirty. Everything was sort of covered with a layer of soot. Um, and so people were very preoccupied with this idea of bringing nature in, but bringing nature into the home and controlling it. So you see things like floral motifs and wallpaper. Um, it became very popular to have terraria or aquaria as part of home decor. And this bright, brilliant green, um, emerald green, uh, really played into that. It, it was the first uh, really light fast, really brilliant bright green colorant that was available to anyone for any type of domestic product. Up until that time, um, you know, for much of the 17th and 18th century, all that was available were organic greens that were really sort of a muddy color. And then um, Sheila's green was discovered at the end of the 18th century, but it wasn't particularly light fast. So it faded very readily. So when emerald green was synthesized around 1814 is when it went into production, um, suddenly it opened up a, a whole new uh, possibility of, of uses. And you know the Victorians went crazy for it. They, they wanted green in everything. Much of your work in particular centers on the Poison Book Project, um, an ongoing investigation into the toxic pigments used in book cloth colorants, primarily arsenic, but also lead, chromium, and mercury. How did the initial idea come about to begin that project? Um, well, it was very much a matter of being in the right place at the right time. <laughs> asking the right question with the right tools at hand to answer that question. Um, the book Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste. So um, this is a book by Shirley Hibbard and it was very much about bringing nature into the home in a tasteful way um, as home decor. And uh, our copy of it at Winterthur Library was requested uh, for an exhibit we had that was going up about Aquaria in the Victorian home. And uh, the book binding was in pretty bad condition. So it came to the conservation lab for treatment. 
And I happened to be reading the book Bitten by Witch Fever at that time, um, which had recently come out. And it was a book about arsenic in uh, William Morris wallpapers and um, sort of the trend of people getting sick from uh, arsenic wallpapers in the 19th century. And Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste was bound in a very bright, vivid green book cloth. And so, you know, as I was working on it, I thought, wow, this is a lot of pigment here. Maybe we should test it, you know, just in case, really thinking of my own safety. Um, but I didn't actually expect it to be full of arsenic. So it was a surprise when we were able to test it. My colleague, um, Dr. Rosie Grayburn is the head of the scientific research and analysis lab here at Winterthur. And we're very fortunate to have um, this really robust uh, conservation science lab with a lot of instrumentation that really allows us to dive into questions like this. So she tested it with a technique called x-ray fluorescence, which is non-destructive. Um, it's really like a handheld ray gun and you shoot it at the object and it's tethered to a computer and it produces spectra, which can then be read and interpreted. And so doing that, we found that copper and arsenic were present in the book cloth. And then we were able to follow up with another type of analysis that told us we were dealing with the compound emerald green. And as soon as we had confirmed that, knowing that this book was mass produced in the Victorian era and that there could be thousands of other copies of it out around the world, um, we realized that we had to start looking more deeply into this and asking the question of, you know, how many books could be out there that were bound in emerald green book cloth. And since then, it's also been discovered um, by colleagues in Germany and Northwestern University that emerald green was also used in bookbinding papers and also used to color the edges of um, text blocks. So when you sometimes see um, bright green colored edges, that could also be arsenic containing emerald green. Now, regardless of dose, exposure to arsenic poises, to say serious health risks is, is a bit of an understatement, right? Um, especially to the entire body, the lungs, the heart, the nervous system. What does this mean for librarians and conservators and researchers who are working with these collections on a regular basis? That's a great question and it's really at the core of the work that the bibliotoxicology working group is doing. Um, we affectionately call it bibtox because bibliotoxicology working group is a mouthful. Um, and Rosie and I convened this international cohort because there are so many questions around what the risk might actually be to users of these book bindings um, and, and other materials and collections. And, you know, it's really, it's a question that takes a team of experts in many different specialties coming together to think about. We certainly know that there is a risk but the current standards, um, so example, like a, a standard, an OSHA standard for arsenic exposure is based on industry. It's based on manufacturing and it's expressed in terms of inhalation exposure, which doesn't really apply when it comes to these book bindings. And so it's very difficult to quantify what the risk is because the risks change depending on human behavior. Um, if you have one of these emerald green books lying on your coffee table and your dog grabs it in its mouth and runs off with it and chews on it, your dog will die. If your dog just snoozes on the couch next to the coffee table where the book is lying, your dog will be fine, right? So um, it really depends on uh, that unpredictable human element. We have found that the amount of arsenic in book cloth is very high um, and it also offsets pretty readily on your hands when you're handling these books. 
um, you don't see any pigment offset, but there is um, a measurable amount of arsenic offsetting on the hands. And, you know, so if you handle one of these books, you might be getting a little bit of arsenic exposure through your skin, but really the, the roots of exposure that we're most concerned about are inhalation and ingestion. So if you wore gloves to protect your skin and you handled this book um, and you were careful not to touch your face or rub your eyes, um, that's probably fine. But if you were holding one of these books and you're eating a sandwich and drinking a cup of coffee, or maybe you're a nail biter, or maybe you're a smoker, um, these are all ways that your arsenic exposure just from normal use of one of these books could be much higher. And of course, you know, there are so many like murder mystery stories, both true and fictional, that talk about arsenic as a, as a murder weapon um, or accidental poisonings. Uh, but arsenic is actually quite dangerous, you know, long before you get an acute dose that immediately kills you. Um, as Sarah mentioned, it has been, it's a known carcinogen. It's linked to multiple types of cancers. And it's also thought that it could be a trigger for um, various other types of uh, chronic illnesses like autoimmune illnesses. And that's something that's still being studied by medical professionals. We're still really trying to kind of wrap our head around that. So I, I think a good baseline is to say that there really is no safe exposure limit to arsenic. And so insofar as possible, um, you know, interaction with materials with containing high levels of arsenic should be limited and you should always be wearing personal protective equipment when you do so. Thank oh, you. and I did just want to add like big kudos to Monica for, um, you know, going and looking into the collection and really trying to get a handle on, um, you know, the collections that NCH GS holds. Um, that's why we're doing this research and why we are trying to make that research publicly available is so that our colleagues can then use this research to look into their own collections, keep themselves safe, and keep users of the collections safe. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Melissa. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about how Monica in the library first stumbled upon, oh, I think we might have poisonous substances in here. So uh, we like to joke that uh, we go into a staff meeting one day and we're like, good news, everybody. It's arsenic. There's like, here's a, a phrase you never, ever thought you would say. Um, Excuse me, I have a question. Hi, yes. Hi, I'm, I'm the person on the end over here. I have two questions, actually. Um, Number one, what is the time frame that we're talking about here generally? I realize we're not totally precise. And I am sitting here thinking about the very large dress collection that we have at the museum. Mm -hmm. And um, while we're talking about books, um, do we also need to be concerned about the dresses? Thank you. Thank you. I will let Monica, who is our curator of collections, uh, take that question, if that is okay. Yeah, yeah, of right. course. All right, well, thanks for the question. Um, yes, we do have a large collection of textiles and I just started as curator, so I haven't had a chance to really look into things yet to see what exactly we have in there. But um, yeah, definitely it is a concern because arsenic was used as a pigment for textiles as well. Okay. So. Um, yeah, that's something that we we do need to keep an eye on. And when we find green textiles in our collection, something that we should treat carefully and possibly look into getting tested in the future. And the time frame? Uh, the time frame was, and Melissa might be able to be a little more specific with this, um, at least for books, it seems like it was more about the 1850s to the 1870s or 80s, although it could be a little bit longer. Um, so far as textiles go, I, I would think it would be within the same general time period, but I would have to look into that. Thank you. Well, Kathleen will be your resource on that. 
Now, Monica, you have only come into contact with the topic and the physical poisonous books fairly recently in our JNS Moyer Library. Over the past year, you have been working at not only creating an inventory, cataloging and digitizing the library's collections with the hopes that all of our books and photos and genealogical records, et cetera, will be more accessible to our researchers. Tell us how you decided to send some of our books for testing at Lehigh University. What led you to suspect that we had poisonous books in our collection? Right, so I kind of have a similar story to what Melissa was saying, where it was just sort of happenstance. So like you said, I was working on the project to uh, digitize all our collections or catalog records so we could get them accessible. So I just spent a lot of time going through the collection and seeing what we really have in there. And there are a number of scrapbooks that are also from, you know, kind of the Victorian era, where it would be people collecting small advertisements from local, um, local stores or local businesses, um, postcards, that kind of thing. And they're just, you know, nice, um, nice designs, pretty pictures. So people would collect them and paste them in a scrapbook. So I was looking in one of those the one day and I noticed there were some postcards that had just very bright, vivid green colors on them. And I was familiar with um, arsenic wallpaper being a you know, potential concern in museum collections. I had heard of that before as well as textiles. So the color just kind of jumped out at me and I thought, huh, like, I wonder if arsenic was also used as a printing dye. And so I just went to Google um, started looking up, you know, arsenic on paper. Um, and I never really managed to answer that particular question because before I got too far into that, I ended up finding the Poison Book Project um, that Melissa was just talking about uh, from Winterter and all of the wonderful research that they've been doing. So as soon as I found that, I just went way down that rabbit hole um, because it's really, really interesting research. Um, and so then I, you know, I started wondering, okay, well, we do have, um, you know, we're a historical museum here. So we do have a significant number of books that are, you know, from the 1800s. So I just started kind of looking around on our shelf, seeing green, 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 green. And, <laughs> you know, started to get a little bit, you know, curious, a little bit concerned, potentially. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of went from there. Unfortunately, you know, I brought it up, yeah, probably at a staff meeting and was saying like, hey, I just found this really cool research. We might have a problem. <laughs> and so, yeah, fortunately, everybody was just very on board to do whatever we could to try to figure out what we had in the collection. Um, and we were very fortunate to be able to partner um, with Dr. Leslie O'Brien at Lehigh University. Um, she's the one that did the testing for us. Um, so I was able to pick out a number of books um, to get tested just to see. So I kind of, you know, narrowed in on the ones that looked like the brightest, scariest greens. <laughs> and um, yeah, fortunately from Winterter, they have a, um, a bookmark essentially where it's that you can um, request from them. I, I'm sure um, Melissa can speak more on that then. Yeah, the, <laughs> there it is on screen. Um, yeah, so it's a wonderful little tool that they will send out to other institutions where it's just a, a bookmark that's printed to have just the right colors um, reproduced of the colors that they found on books that do contain arsenic. So you can just use it sort of as a finding aid and do a visual comparison to the books in your collection. Um, so that was definitely helpful in narrowing down the books that we wanted to test. Um, and fortunately, once I got into the collection, most of the green books that I saw were not that really bright, vivid green that's very concerning. Um, so we picked out the ones that looked like they could potentially be hazardous, um, and that's what that's what we ended up getting tested. Um, and I do have some slides that I can show. Uh, if I can share the screen, I can show you guys the books that we got tested from the collection. Yes, absolutely. I know that's what everyone is here for, to see some <laughs> some real arsenic. <laughs> so do you uh, want to share the slides? Do you want the lab results? Um, I They are all together, so I will just go ahead and share my screen you got um, and let you guys know what you're looking at.
Bear with me a moment. Okay. So is that sharing properly? You can see that? On my end. Okay. Okay, so these are the books that we sent to get tested. Um, so you'll see not everything here is green. Um, as uh, we alluded to previously, or somebody mentioned, um, there are other colors that are also mm -hmm. potentially hazardous, including um, a lot of the, the yellows and tans um, that have uh, potentially lead in them. Um, red books can potentially have mercury in them as well. Um, so most of what we focused on were these green books. And you'll see there's kind of a, a variety of shades. Um, and we definitely also targeted books that were within that time period um, of when they were finding, you know, most or the, most of the arsenic books were being published. So there were two books up. I don't, can you see my cursor moving yep. around? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these two books up here are bound with paper. Um, and the rest of them are all book cloth, except for this uh, funky looking one down here. But these two were paper. The rest of the green ones were book cloth. Um, and arsenic was found to be used in both paper and book cloth. And so let's see. Um, this is how we tested them. So we did uh, use a different method than what uh, Melissa had been using at Winter Terror. Um, so at Lehigh, they have. Uh, we used energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so it's a different type of analysis um, that's uh, technically a destructive analysis because to fit the sample in the machine, you do have to remove a little piece from the book, um, which we were comfortable doing because it's such a small, um, a small portion of the book cloth that you need to remove. And then also we kind of, a lot of the books that we were using, we kind of sampled ones that were in slightly poor condition. So we targeted areas where they were already a little bit frayed at the edge, and we felt comfortable removing a little bit of that, excuse me, a little bit of that material without damaging the book. Um, so you can see we just uh, cut off a tiny bit on um, this one here, just that little section there that was pulled off. Um, and then the samples over here on the side, that's what was added into the machine. So I am absolutely not an expert on X-ray spectroscopy. Um, so <laughs> in general, um, the samples are hit with an, an electron beam, I believe, or a laser beam, and uh, it will hit the sample, x-rays will be diffracted, there's a computer that does lots of wizardry and magic uh, that measures um, the different levels of energy that are coming off of the samples. So depending on what um, heavy metals are potentially present in the samples, you'll get a different reading on the computer. Um, and again, I don't I don't know how to explain the specifics. I'm sure Melissa would have some more in, insight into that as well. But um, but basically, that these... was a perfect explanation. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so those were the samples that we took. And then so again, these were the books we sampled. And these were our results. Um, so you'll see about half of the books that we sampled uh, came back with high enough levels of heavy metals to be a concern. Um, the rest of them had trace heavy metals, so there was, you know, slight bits that were measurable, but not necessarily concerning. Um, but we did have just one book that had arsenic. And I was actually a little bit surprised that we had any with arsenic, um, and it turned out to be one of the paper um, the paper bound volumes as well. So this one is called The Pearl and it was published in 1831. Um, and the interesting thing about this one, well, there are several interesting things about it, but um, well, let's see if I can go to the next slide quick. So this book you'll see is bound with green paper on the covers, but the spine is actually leather bound. So at first, when I was going through and reviewing the books on the shelf, I wasn't necessarily pulling every book off to look at the different sections of the book. Then I found this one and realized, oh, I would have missed that had I not been pulling the books off. So I had to start over <laughs> and look at you know the different sections of the book, because um, as Melissa was saying, it can all the the dye could also be used on the edges as well as on the inside of the book. So unless you really open them all up and inspect them. You're not necessarily going to know. 
Um, so that was, yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, if I go back one here. So you see the other major issue that we were popping up with was lead, um, lead chromate, um, which could be used in the greens and the yellows. And so we had several that came back with high levels of lead. And then in the bottom right corner of the screen here, this is a book that's uh, it's bound in paper and it's marbled paper where they would use different colors of dye kind of on the surface of water, swirl them around with a stick to get all these neat patterns and then dip the paper in them. Um, so we were curious about that as well because I had found a reference online of someone who did find um, heavy metals in those, those books as well. So we sampled that one and it turned out that uh, the yellow color in there had lead as well. So even though not the entire book or not all of the colors were toxic, some of them are. And you can see there on the end that that one also was bound, or excuse me, was uh, dyed on the edges of the text block as well. Um, so this was the arsenic book. And these were the results that we got where the image on the left, that's through the electron mic microscope. So if you look at the scale on the bottom, that's 100 micrometers and a micrometer is a millionth of a meter. So it's really, really small, very magnified um, section. You can see kind of the raggedy edges of the paper um, that we sampled here. And then the chart, um, when you get the, the readout from the computer after you do the sample, you'll get the chart that has peaks of the heavy metals that it was able to identify. So you'll see here this tall peak um, with AS, that's the chemical symbol for arsenic. Um, and then you'll also see copper here, because um, it was probably a copper, copper arsenite, copper, ar copper and arsenic compound. Um, but which one, I don't know exactly, but um, the fact that it has arsenic is really the important part for us because that's what we need to know in order to treat the book properly um, so we know how to handle it properly. Um, so this is just another example. This was one of the yellow colored books it's that we dangerous if you inhale it or ingest it a little bit will get on your skin which will <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> um yeah so if you inhale it ingest it or potentially absorbing through your skin um but so this one is uh again one of the yellow ones uh the yellow books so this had high levels of lead in it and again you can see on the uh, on the chart, the spike there, PB is for lead. Um, and then, yep, just real quick here, this was a, one of the samples of that marble colored paper. So you can see one little tiny sample of paper has two different shades of red. It has white, green, or excuse me, blues and yellows. Um, and then the picture on the right here, that's under magnification and you can see the different colors are kind of reflecting different amounts of light based on what metals are, are in the pigments. Um, oh, and then this is just, <laughs> they, this is a picture of some of the postcards that I was talking about that first kind of sent me down this path um, with some of these really brightly colored greens. Um, and so this is something that, these are questions that still need to be answered. Um, so we're going to have a lot more research and ex exploration to do moving into the future as well. Um, so that's a, a brief gist. Uh, <laughs> so we'll get some nice pretty pictures. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I, I would like to reassure, um, I know we have a few members and uh, board members and CHGS members and certainly colleagues who are joining us for this program tonight. Um, I want to reassure you that we are very, very cautious now about taking these books out and how we handle them and how they are stored. So please assure that your safety is our primary concern. And I would like to add to that, all of the books that we had tested, um, especially the ones that tested positive for anything are still kept separately at this point. They're not back on the shelves. Um, the book that contains arsenic will likely never go back on the shelf. Um, our library is primarily focused on genealogical research. And this particular book really 
it doesn't have anything to do with genealogy. I think it's just the novel. So there's not really any reason that it should be out um, and in a space where anyone could touch it accidentally. So we'll be sure to keep, you know, the, the dangerous stuff locked away. So here's a, a question as we start to move towards the end of this portion of the discussion. It's a question that I would like to pose to both Monica and Melissa. The use of this emerald green pigment was situated in a very specific cultural and societal standard. Um, so what, even though this is a, a question that is specific to books from a certain time period, what are the lessons that we can learn from, from the popularity of this pigment and also from the challenges that we are facing when we're dealing with the repercussions of it in the 21st century? Um, so I know that's like a really <laughs> loaded question. <laughs> sure, it absolutely is. Um, I think something uh, that this project has really taught me is that um, human nature doesn't really change. <laughs> we, we are still doing the same thing that the Victorians did. We use materials that we don't fully understand um, because it's convenient or because they have properties that we really like. Um, so, you know, we can critique the Victorians for buying books and wallpaper and children's toys that were loaded with arsenic. But, you know, the truth is that we all have upholstered furniture in our homes that is loaded with formaldehyde and other chemicals that are also known carcinogens. And, um, you know, we make materials and then as we discover they contain toxic components that are making people sick, we ban those materials, right? Like I'm sure you've all seen all the BPA free plastics out there now, right? Well, we probably replaced BPA with something just as toxic. We just haven't tested it and we don't know yet. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the environmental working group, but um, they have a great free online database called the Skin Deep Database. And they test um, household and uh, like bath and beauty products, and then they give them a rating. And so instead of uh, lobbying to have you know, certain chemicals banned, they believe in just putting information in the hands of consumers so consumers can decide how to spend their money the way they would like. And, you know, I have certain health challenges, so I choose to use the Skin Deep database. And, you know, I've come up with a, you know, a threshold that I'm personally comfortable with. And I don't buy any products that I put on my body or that I clean my home with that doesn't meet a certain rating in the environmental working groups database. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I'm still getting exposed to that. You know, I have upholstered furniture, right? Like, and, and I go out into society and I interact with other materials. So I'm sure I'm being exposed to plenty of other carcinogens and toxic materials. But, you know, I feel like the best we can do is to continue to do research, to try to understand the materials that make up our built world and then just make the best choices that we can for ourselves and for our families. My two cents. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's both at the same time a, a blessing and a curse to know that folks back in the 1850s were asking themselves the same questions. Like, should I be using this? Well, what the heck, let me have this one thing even though it's killing me, what else do I have, right? Yeah, I would definitely second pretty much everything Melissa just said. It's it's really easy to critique uh, Victorians for using emerald green and using um, you know a, you know wearing green dresses that's colored with the same pigment that they use as a rat poison. However, you know it was the same same story that we still have today with a number of different things where 
the people who were financially invested in selling arsenic were the ones who were arguing, no, no, it's safe. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Here, I'll eat a spoonful to prove it. <laughs> That's the same kind of argument um, that companies will still use today. Um, you know, classic example would be leaded gasoline. Um, look at how long it took to, you know, have lead actually be removed from gasoline. Um, or cigarettes um, and nicotine. It's a lot of the people doing the arguing um, that it's okay is are the people who are financially invested. And uh, human nature is a little bit short-sighted a lot of the time. So it's easy to, you know, take what that authority says as comforting um, and continue to just go with it and think, oh, it's not going to, it won't be me. It'll never happen to me. But yeah, so it's um it's interesting. The more you learn about it, the more you realize it's just kind of the same ongoing story. But the best thing that we can do is just be more and more aware of it um, so that we're treating these things with the uh, respect that they deserve. Great. Well, there are actually some great questions in the chat. Um, so I'm just I'm going to read them out and I'm just going to pose them to both of you and whoever would like to to jump on in, please feel free to do so. Um, we have a question on research that has been published, um, particularly to Bib Talks. Um, will there be, um, in, in regards to past publications and also future publications, is there anything that you are working on now that, um, that you would like to mention, anything that you have previously published, any updates to anything, any future projects that you are working on with BibTalks? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so um, the I belong to the American Institute for Conservation, which is the um, professional organization in the US for conservators. And um, through their journal, the journal for the American Institute for Conservation, um, earlier in Oh, not this year anymore. It's 2023 now. Um, early in 2022, um, my colleague Rosie and I published uh, an article about um, discovering the emerald green book cloth. And we have another article coming out this March in the journal Collections, which is targeted to museum and archives professionals. And so that's sort of an update um, and speaking more broadly about heavy metals in uh, book cloth. And then we are also working on a technical bulletin, again, for GAAIC, that is about our testing of storage uh, enclosures for our Seneca books. So we're looking at um, Colibri polyethylene dust jackets, we're looking at Mylar dust jackets, and we're looking at the polyethylene baggies, and we're testing those for arsenic offset um, and shedding and just trying to get a handle on um, maybe some alternative ways to store our Seneca books safely. Um, and then there's been uh, a number of uh, articles about the project in the popular media as well. There was an article in National Geographic and an article in Discover Magazine as well. And then Bib Talks is working on several white papers. And we haven't quite figured out what our venue for dissemination for those is going to be. We're sort of negotiating with AIC and thinking about um, fundraising for our own website, but, uh, but we are in the research stage right now of producing white papers that we do hope to distribute widely. That's thank you great. for that question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting us all know. I know I will be certainly looking out for those as well. We have a, a really intriguing question about book dealers. Um, is it possible that one day rare book dealers may want to or may be asked to disclose such information on their items, or does this already occur in the rare book collecting world? Anybody? So <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, um, but my, my best guess would be that it's not something that a lot of people are necessarily aware of because um, the research is still pretty new, and also the testing is not 
necessarily accessible to everyone. Um, we were really fortunate to be able to partner with Lehigh to get some of our books tested. Not every institution has access to that. And if you're a private book dealer, I would assume you also might not have access to those avenues. Um, so ideally, hopefully in the future, um, when people are more aware of it, that will be something that people consider. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the things that I think was so important to us. Um, and part of the reason why we wanted to have this talk, like Melissa was saying earlier, it's just awareness. It's getting everybody on the same page to know that this is a potential issue. Because I'm sure a lot of you folks that are listening in tonight, um, you're all fans of history. Everybody likes to go antiquing. You probably all have personal collections of things at home. So, you know, it's, yeah, they're more likely, our, our cynical books are more likely to pop up in big libraries. But, uh, you know, it's something that people should just, you know, have in the back of their mind. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Monica. So um, a couple of the books in our study collection that we use for testing on, I actually found in secondhand bookstores. Um, one, I found at a local bookstore and one I bought on eBay. So they're definitely out there. And I've also, I've looked through a few book catalogs recently for rare book dealers and you know, you start to recognize the color after a while. And I'm like, oh, that one, oh, published in 1855. Like that one is definitely going to be emerald <laughs> green. Um, we have um, the bookmarks that Monica was talking about earlier. Um, we send those out on request to anyone who requests them. And, um, and we have gotten a number of emails from uh, book dealers who wanted to, to have a bookmark or have a handful of bookmarks to hand out in their shop. But it's a really good question as to whether they're disclosing um, what they know or not um, to customers. And I think there are just many, many book dealers who probably haven't yet heard about um, the project. So more outreach. So tell, tell your local bookshop owners and rare book dealers that you know. Hey, did you have a question? Are you... You're unmuted, oh, correct? Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, it, it just occurred to me because um, I was in New York this weekend and I had a chance to actually go to Bauman's Rare Books. Mm. And I about lost my mind when I went in the door. <laughs> <laughs> and there were at least two copies that were so vibrant, such shades of vibrant green that I just couldn't help staring and you know these were books that were priced at five and six uh digits for sale and i was so all of a sudden i was like oh i wonder if one day dealers are going to be forced to do this i mean i'm sure nobody wants to talk about provenance and content but which then got me thinking today about um end papers marbled end papers like you were talking about i wonder if if do you all think that that's going to, this is a side thought, uh, if you all think that that's going to have to be a natural offshoot of what you're doing now, way far in the future. <laughs> so that was the comment and there's the question. <laughs> well, I, I have a colleague actually who, um, she went to a, the training program in Mexico City um, she actually lives in New Jersey now, but she wrote her thesis on um, toxic pigments in marble papers in uh, oh, Central America. Um, that thesis is written in Spanish. <laughs> and, um, and so I've been encouraging her um, to translate it into English um, and, you know, publish it again in the U.S. And um, her name is Lucia Tourner. And um, she has a private practice in New Jersey. And on her website, she has promised me that she's going to um, translate and post a summary of her thesis, oh, um, cool. kind of oh, summarizing okay. those, those different um, toxic pigments that were used in marble paper. Because I think you're absolutely right. I think it's definitely another area of research. Um, and I know of a master's student at the West Dean Conservation Program for book conservation, who is now looking into paste papers 
and, um, and, you know, the toxic pigments that may have been used to color those paste papers because that starch uh, binding that, um, that the pigment is in is pretty vulnerable to abrasion and, and to moisture. And so he's going to start doing some testing to, to see if he can wrap his head around the risk that might be inherent there. So, um, so there you go. Bib talks, right? We started yeah. <laughs> uh, book cloth, but, um, it turns out there are all these other aspects of book wow. bindings that are worth looking into. So. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That's just a great question. Um, we may, let's go with one more, I think. Uh, John has a question. Are the risks higher for book conservators who work with cutting and working with book cloth? Sorry. Great Pardon. question, John. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, because of the way that the book cloth is manipulated for some very standard types of book repair. Um, so for example, cloth bindings are very prone to having the spine covering fall off. And a very standard repair is to lift the book cloth on the front and back covers, um, you know, like maybe just an inch, lift it away so that you can tuck new repair material underneath. And when you do that, you're really bending that book cloth quite a lot. And the emerald green pigment is so loosely bound to that underlying cloth that um, I think that sort of manipulation and movement is much more likely to cause it to shatter off of the cloth and offset. And um, our industrial hygienist that we've been consulting with also thinks that introducing moisture through the use of adhesives um, could also cause the arsenic in that pigmented book cloth to sort of migrate unpredictably. And, um, and you could end up with higher concentrations of arsenic in one area versus another. So I, I definitely do think that the risks are higher for conservators. And, you know, I think we have to ask the question, like, like, why can't we just put it in a box or, you know, put it in, a, in an enclosure? If it's known to contain arsenic, does it really need to be repaired? Because you're not going to be handing that book to patrons to use anyway. So these are, these are all really important questions to ask. Um, I have dropped into the chat the link to our arsenical books yes. list on the wiki. So we've um, put a list on there of all the known titles um, that we've found arsenic in, and we are adding to that all the time. I have to tell you, I have a waiting list of about 30 more books to add to that list that I just haven't had a chance to, to do yet, but I'm hoping within the next few weeks. Um, so we're at 128 books now. Ooh. Um, which I think represents about 112 different titles. Um, and then I've also dropped the email address that you can use if you'd like to request a bookmark. Um, I put that in the chat as well. Thank you. And I have we have so many folks to thank for tonight's program, um, especially to Monica and Melissa for giving us their time and their expertise. Um, I also really want to thank Dr. Ned Heindel, who connected us with Lehigh University for NCHGS to be able to send our materials out for testing. Um, I really want to thank our colleagues and our coworkers who are, um, who are with us tonight, uh, especially from, from me and Monica, who uh, we have both been so grateful um, to work with such a great team who has encouraged us to go down these research rabbit holes and see where it takes us. Um, and to come into staff meetings and be like, good news, guys, we found more poison and for them to think it's cool. Um, and to thank you so much to our members and all of our visitors who allow us to continue to provide you with these kinds of programs. Um, so I encourage you to visit the Winter Tour website. I know Melissa said she put the information in the chat, so I encourage you to go visit that. Um, 
I also encourage you to visit sigilmuseum.org. You can see all of our upcoming programs and events. We are going to do both virtual and in-person programming this year on a very wide range of topics. Um, you can find more information on membership, access some of our online databases, um, some of our online exhibit collections, and hopefully soon some of our research from our research library. Um, anything that our presenters would like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I would just like to say um, a big thank you to Melissa and all the folks at Winterter for doing this amazing research and making it so accessible um, to, you know, other institutions like us. The wiki page is wonderful, and it was really easy to find the resources that I need needed to try to, you know, delve deeper into this issue. Um, so yeah, accessibility of this kind of knowledge is huge. So big thank you to Melissa for that. And thank you for inviting me to be here today. And thank you for the work that you're doing and for helping our um, advocacy and outreach work uh, around this topic. So thanks all around. To you as well. And I also want to let folks know who are still here um, that the email that you've signed up with, I will be emailing you within a few days once this recording is up on YouTube. It will have closed captioning, so you'll be able to watch it back. Um, we try to do as good of a job closed captioning um, as possible. I know that really, really helps with folks who have um, accessibility questions. So I will send you all the link to that once it is up. And a big thank you to everyone once again, and we hope to see you at future programs. Thanks a lot. Thank you.